Welcome to the online service of Harborsite Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join the morning service already in progress. Chapter 1 of the book of Proverbs, at least three times, this person comes across our path, and he is the fool. He, he comes across the, our path about some 50 times in the book of Proverbs alone, and should be studied, I think, very closely because one of the reasons why Proverbs is presented to us is not necessarily to fix the problems we get ourselves in, although that is applicable. It does do that. It is to prevent us from having the problems. If we follow what Solomon says in Proverbs and we gain that wisdom, it will help us avoid difficulty. How many of you prayed this morning? Lord, I hope I have a difficult day today. <laughs> Nobody does that, right? Um, but sometimes, we, and oftentimes, we will pray, Lord, I hope I have a good day today. And the Bible does say, and it is clear, that today is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And the fool, on the other hand, Needs Again, he needs some wisdom. Um, he should be studied very closely so we might avoid his folly. Don't do what he did. How many of you have ever been there and done that? You know what I'm talking about? I didn't say specifically, okay? Um, but, uh, you, you know, and you can speak from experience to people. Uh, hey, look, I, I, you're, you're getting ready to do that. I've been there, done that. Could be a, a great time, you know, whatever it was. You went on a trip. Somebody's asking you about, hey, we're thinking about going to. And I've had uh, some folks, we, we frequented Charleston, South Carolina over the last several years on vacation. Some people would come to me and say, hey, uh, we're thinking about going to Charleston, South Carolina. Is there anything to do down there? It's like, hmm, let me see. Is there? Yes, there is. As a matter of fact, and we give them, the, you know, restaurants to go to, places to see, different things, and so forth. And, and the, the book of Proverbs presents the fool in such a way that you could say, don't go there, don't do that. And his relationship to knowledge and wisdom is and should be of special interest to us. Because if we want to be wise, let's ask this question. How many of us need to be wise? We all do, don't we? Certainly. And I want us to look at what Proverbs has to say about the fool, I want to preach a message to you that I have entitled, Just Be Wise Regarding Knowledge. Because we think of wisdom, and what is the, what, what is the, the opposite of, of, of that? It's not ignorance, it's foolishness. And the fool has, a, has an interesting relationship with knowledge and wisdom. We'll look at that this morning, but let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to look into your word now. We thank you for the service that we have enjoyed already, the fellowship and the praying, praying, praying for requests and different things and the opportunity to celebrate uh, Bob's birthday with him. And, and we thank you for uh, their being here. Ask your strength upon him. Uh, we pray that you would help us as we uh, look at this, wis one of these, w the wisdom books of the Old Testament, Proverbs, that you would help us to examine our lives, help us to consider the possibility that we may be not as wise as we think we are. Help us to learn, Lord, uh, not to do what the fool does. And if we're involved in that, if we have a mindset or an attitude our actions would betray that we're less than wise. We pray that you'd help us to deal with those things properly and change those things properly and, and, and become wise people. Each person here, whether here in person or, or online, needs to be wise. They have responsibilities that they need to handle wisely. They have relationships that they need to handle wisely. 
they have decisions that they need maybe wise counsel and they need to make a decision that is a wise decision that would be pleasing in your sight and bring honor and glory to thee we pray that you would help us to look at these truths and apply them to our lives and change what is necessary to be changed we pray for the children that their time would be profitable Remove any of the distractions that have come our way, Lord, and help us to focus our attention upon your word. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you're in the book of Proverbs. Hold your finger in Proverbs 1 because we're going to come back to this. But I want you to turn, and we will be looking several places in Proverbs, so please stay up with me. I think it's important for us to not only hear it but see it uh, as well. But Proverbs 22, I want us to look at the progress. Does... Does, does everybody start out foolish? Does everybody start out foolish? Well, look at Proverbs 22 and verse number 15. Proverbs 22, 15 says, what's the first word? Foolishness. Foolishness, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. What does that mean? Well, Solomon recognizes the foolish and sinful nature uh, of, of children. Why is that? Why do children, even two-year-old, little blonde-haired, gray-eyed little girls, why are, do they have a foolish nature? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Right? We're all sinners. And with that nature comes foolishness. And the sin nature that is imparted to us because of Adam's sin imparts a self-centered attitude to everybody. And it can be overcome. We can learn how to be wise. We can turn from our foolishness just like children You know, and one of the one of the ways of doing that, it says the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. How many of you were ever when you were? Well, okay, let's again, let me uh, let me take the pressure off of you. Okay, you know, somebody as a child was very foolish. How many of you know that know somebody like that? Okay, and I'm not talking about the person in the mirror that you saw this morning necessarily. Okay. But if it applies, okay, if that shoe fits, you know what to do with it, right? But they, 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 were, they were foolish, and then mom and dad got involved, and what happened? They, got, they, they, they learned that foolishness has consequences, right? And hopefully they learned some lessons so they don't do that again. Don't, I've been there, done that, and you don't want to do that, right? I, I'm, I'm anticipating the day when... Our oldest granddaughter talks to any other grandchildren that the Lord may bless us with. And in particular, I'm thinking about Harper when she arrives and she gets old enough to understand. I was thinking about this just um, this morning. For some reason, it came to my mind that when Harper is Ellis's age, Ellis will be in kindergarten. Thereabouts. They're about two and a half years apart. And... I wonder if Ellis will, because she's very good. She likes to wag her little finger. I mentioned that before uh, to you. No, no. No, no. She's, uh, she has this pacifier that they give her before she goes to bed. And when it comes time to go to bed, for some reason, she'll go, no, no, Passy. No, no. And I wonder if she's going to line her siblings up, at least Harper, and she go, no, no. You know? Been there, I've been there, done that, and you don't want to go there, okay? Well, we all have that nature, and everyone is inclined to be foolish, even adults. How many of you know adults who you look at something that they do, or you look, maybe it is a, it's a pattern in their life, and you just, you know, the, the face palm emoji is, that's all you can say, right? You look at it, and you go, What? We're all inclined to be that way. We're not, we, we can't be judgmental necessarily because we have probably, as I've said, been there, done that. Maybe it's not exactly the same thing, but we've all been foolish in our lives. And, 
an undisciplined spirit, that spirit that is always in us, as even as children and even as adults, even after we get saved. You know, the thing about being saved, it's a wonderful thing, is it not, to know that your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven. Amen. But that doesn't mean that we're no longer going to sin. There's always going to be that struggle. One of my deacons, when I was in Monroe County, he was working uh, for several years before he retired uh, while I was his pastor and so forth. And I think he retired while I was his pastor. Anyway, he, he was talking to me. I used an illustration. There was a missionary to the Indians years ago, and he led the chief to the Lord. And the, the, the wonderful thing about that was that prior to leading the chief to the Lord, nobody in this tribe of, of Indians got saved. Nobody would make that commitment for Christ because they were following the lead of their chief. When he got saved, people got serious. If it's good enough for him, it's got to be good enough for us. And there, there was a, a, lot of, a lot of salvation decisions and so forth. A year or so later, after the chief got saved, the missionary was talking to him and he asked him, since you've been saved, do you still struggle? And the obvious answer is yes. And, and the missionary was asking me, well, chief, explain that to me. And he said, well, the way I explain it to my people and others that, that wonder and ask is it's kind of like in me, I have two dogs. I have a white dog and I have a black dog. The black dog represents my old nature. The white dog represents my new nature as a Christian since I've been saved. And they fight. The missionary said, well, chief, which one wins? And he said, the one I feed. I used that illustration, and this deacon of mine went to work the following day or a few days later, and with a Sharpie on his hard hat, wrote, two dogs. And he showed me the hat after he retired. He said, there it is. See, told you. And I said, yeah, that's pretty interesting. I said, why'd you do that? And he said, because of that illustration. He said, you would not believe, Pastor, how many people ask me, what's that mean? And he gets to tell them. Amen. And there's that, there, there is that in us, each one of us. There's, there's the old man Paul mentions it in Ephesians and Colossians, that old man, he said, and he said, but he says to put on the new man, right? But there's going to be that war, that, that conflict in children as well and, and in adults also. And an undisciplined spirit takes the child after his own desires. I mean, how many of you like to do your own thing? Right? We all do. Right? Maybe it was when you were a child, you were getting older, and maybe got some more responsibility and from your parents or more, you know, chores or whatever it was. And, and uh, you know, the, the standard operating procedure is you come home, change clothes, go do your chores, get your homework done, and, and, and all that kind of thing. And maybe it was that you just decided because you're older, I'm going to come home and I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go hunting or whatever it is, and the chores can wait. And dad comes home, and the chores are not done. And what happens? You know what happens. There are consequences, right? But you can do that if you want to. You can continue to be foolish. You can continue to do what you want, but understand this. There are consequences to that. And everyone is inclined to do that. Because we like to do that. It's easy to do that. Satan will whisper in your ear, won't he? Why, why are you going to do that? That's hard. That's difficult. 
You mean your pastor suggests that maybe you should read your Bible a few minutes every day? You should pray? You should be a testimony to other people? You should live by the principles that are in God's word? Really? Why would you do that? That's hard. That's too hard. A lot of people say, and I've heard this before myself, and you, maybe you have as well when you're trying to uh, be an encouragement to somebody to get saved or come to church or something like that. And, and they say, well, you know, the Bible, all, all it is is a bunch of don'ts. Don't. Don't do this. Don't do that. Christianity, that's all it is. You can't do this and you can't do that. Well, I guess there's some truth to that. But one of the things that makes Christianity, biblical Christianity and salvation different is that my love for the Lord should cause me to not want to whatever it is. But everyone is inclined to be foolish. And that undisciplined foolishness certainly takes that child into his own desires that will never please the Lord. Look at Proverbs 14. I promise you we're going to come to Proverbs 1 here in just a little bit. But look at Proverbs chapter 14. Because that process or that undisciplined spirit of foolishness that is bound in the heart of a child, if left unchecked, what does it do? Well, it leads to more foolishness. Look at Proverbs 14 and verse number 18 says the simple or the fool inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. The word inherit there is in the verb form in this particular verse, and the verb form of the word inherit in the Hebrew is found some 60 times in the Old Testament, and it means, now notice this, it means giving or receiving property which is part of a permanent possession. Now, what does that mean? If you are going to continue to be foolish, guess what you get? Foolishness. If you decide that you are going to continue to do what you want, to please yourself, to be self-sufficient, you know, and and so forth and so on. You're not going to pay attention to wise counsel. You're going to continue to do what you want to do. Then guess what you can expect to be produced in your life? More foolishness, more folly. And the principle of sowing and reaping, which Paul gives us in Galatians chapter six, he says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. What a man sows that shall he also reap. You understand how that works out. If I go and I want to, how many of you like watermelon? I like watermelon. I like, I really like honeydew melon a little bit better than watermelon, but I don't know. If they, did, they, did, they have, did they have a run on honeydew melons recently or this past summer? Because I don't think I've seen one. Did they stop growing them or making them or whatever? I don't know. Um, did the you know did the did the honeydew make did the honeydew melon uh, workers of America did they all go on strike or something I don't know but a good watermelon is is something you know summertime and and all of that well, you know where watermelons come from watermelons if you plant a if you plant a peach seed you're going to get watermelons right. If you take a tomato seed and throw it in your backyard and some prepared dirt and water it and that kind of thing, put a little Vigoro on it, it'll, it'll produce watermelons. Right? No, it won't. You understand the process. You understand the principle. What you sow eventually is going to reap. You're going to reap a harvest of that. And the thing about it is, What you reap is oftentimes proportionally greater than what you sow. You know, one one corn seed, okay, 
you put it in the ground and it grows and it gets a stalk and how many ears of corn it kind of depends on the variety i'm i'm sure and, and so forth of of the uh, the corn and the growing conditions and so forth, but every stalk of corn is most probably going to have more than one ear of corn on it, right? It's not going to just have a, a, an ear of corn with one kernel on it, is it? No, certainly not. So you understand the principle there, and it, 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 this particular sowing and reaping principle is in view, but the, the fool, when he sows folly, he receives the same thing. But the thing about foolish people is when they sow folly, they're not expecting to get folly in return, are they? They're hoping things will work out, aren't they? They're hoping that, that, that the decision, the foolish decision that they made will work out. Everybody will be okay with it. God will honor it. Well, I'm sorry to have to tell you, but that's not the case. When you sow folly, you can expect it. And unfortunately, because that principle is in view here, you continue to sow folly and it's going to be permanent. Now, how many of us want, really, really want, to look back on our lives someday and realize that the reason we were not successful, and he mentions here in verse 18 there, notice the verse, he said, the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Now, what that means in the, in the original language is this. The prudent, and a.k.a. also known as what? Prudent people are often wise people. Okay? Book of Proverbs says in two different places that the prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. Okay? He thinks about the consequences. He thinks about the future. He thinks about... Um, you know, how to prepare and different things like that. The simple, the fool, pass on and are punished. They have to do, deal with all the foolishness that comes from not being prepared, not being conscientious, not, not being diligent, not giving thought to the future and how their actions might reap a harvest of some sort. But the prudent, it says, are crowned with knowledge. Now, what that means is, because the prudent person makes wise decisions, guess what he gets out of it? He gets blessing out of it. And the fool, when he inherits folly, that's all he gets. But when the prudent sow wisdom into their lives and make those actions and those decisions that are wise, that are pleasing to the Lord, they're following the Lord and so forth. What comes out of it? Blessing. Answer this question for me. Which would you prefer? I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed so, so much that, you know, you know my, my blesser can't handle it anymore. You know? God just blesses me to a point where I, I don't know if I would do this or not. I don't know that I would say, okay, Lord, you can stop blessing me enough uh, now because you blessed me enough and I, I, don't, I can't handle any more blessings. Now, I don't think I want to go there. So I'm just going to ask the Lord to just keep blessing me as much as I need to be blessed, as much as he wants to, and that kind of thing. And I'm going to continue, hopefully, to, con to, to, to sow those wise decisions into my, my life and our church and my family and so forth. But continued foolishness, all it leads to is more foolishness. That's all it leads to. Unchecked foolishness also becomes, if you want to look at, Proverbs 17, unchecked foolishness, okay? It started in the heart of a child. We got that. We're all there, right? It was allowed to continue and grow undisciplined. And now what has it become? 
it becomes unchangeable character. We all know people, even as adults, who are foolish. Their lives verify it. Every decision they make is a foolish decision, and they're reaping what they're sowing. And for whatever reason, they just don't get it. They just don't see it. It's gone a little farther. Notice verse 10 of Proverbs 17, where it says, A reproof entereth more into a wise man. Okay, now what is a reproof? Well, it is a scolding. How many of you got scolded when you were a kid? You know how that is, right? You did something and mom, you know, just like Ellis. No, no. No, no. Hey, you no, uh-uh. Don't do that. I can remember. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. I am not calling you animals. <laughs> but the two dogs that we had, we got Susie when she was a eight or ten week old fuzzy little black dog. We got Nate when he was about three, schnauzer. And in our time with those dogs, as I would deal with them, there would be some times when we would be out and, and, and I would, you know, they'd head off somewhere and I would go, ah, ah. And, you know, the interesting thing about dogs is they know who their master is, right? And they often will listen to their master, won't they? Now answer this question for me. How is it that human beings who are certainly smarter, are we not, than dogs, one, don't know who their master is, and even if they do, don't listen to what he has to say. Why is that? That's an emoji, by the way. But notice what he says. In Proverbs 17.10, a reproof entereth more into a wise man. Just going, ah. Uh-uh. No, come back here. And I've seen both of those animals, Susie in particular, because she was often off lead. She would look at whatever it was she was after, and her little hind legs would just quiver. <laughs> And I'd go, ah, you get back over here. And she'd go, <laughs> off she'd come. Nate, same kind of thing. I never had him off lead, but, you know, he was not pulling all the time and that kind of thing. I'd sit there and he'd be pointed in some direction. I want to go over here. And he's like, you know, that little nub of tail is wiggling a thousand miles an hour. And the RPM on that is starting to lift his body up off the ground. And I'd go, ah, <laughs> here we go. A reproof. Don't do that. Hey, no, I'm seeing it in Jonathan and Madison with Ellis. No, ma'am. Over there she goes. And she's back, uh, no ma'am. Because you, you know how that is. You can read the little kid's mind, right? They're headed over there somewhere. They're going to stick a, stick a fork in, 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 the, in the wall socket, right? Just to see what happens, right? No ma'am. Uh, 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 come back over here. A reproof. That's all it is. It's a scolding if you want to call it that. Hey, don't do, why did, what are you thinking? Are you really about ready to do that? Wise man says, no, you know, that's probably foolish, and I don't think I want that. 
because I know what's coming out of it. But notice here, verse number 10 says a reproof, just a, just a verbal scolding. Hey, don't do that. What do you think? I, don't do that. It entereth into a wise man. Now notice the contrast. Then a hundred stripes into a fool. What does that mean? That means you could take your belt off and you could flail away on the back of the fool till your arms are tired. And you know what it does? No good. Because the fool, he's been undisciplined this, this long and, and this far in his life it be, has become his character. It is ingrained into him, and it doesn't matter what kind of consequences, what kind of punishment that he ends up receiving. He is still going to be a fool. Mark it down. Now, how many of us want to be that way? And it's frustrating. If you got one, what do you do with them? Because see that hundred stripes now, back in Solomon's day, you could get away with that. You look at them cockeyed today, and they're, they're, they're you know, it, 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 man, you just, it, did, did you... You made you you made you just you just made me feel uncomfortable, and I don't like feeling uncomfortable. I'm going to call somebody. I'm going to call David Arbuckle up, and I'm going to say, <clears throat> "My daddy scolded me, and I feel uncomfortable. I think we need to do something about it." But it doesn't matter what the, the fool gets as a consequence of his foolishness. His character is so hardened now that even drastic consequences make no difference. Look at Proverbs 26. Just a few pages over. Proverbs 26 Verse number 11. Now this is a very, if you're a little squeamish, maybe, you know, it's, and lunch is, lunchtime is coming, maybe you don't want to read this verse. It's going to be too late because I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> but notice the picture. As a dog returneth to his vomit. How picturesque is that? We all know what that is. I had an evangelist friend of mine years ago. He was at our church in Monroe County, and he, was, he, he also uh, preached at uh, different camps and different things we've been to. And I, I've heard him use this illustration several different times. When he was growing up, I think he was from, the, well, I, I, I know where I am, so I won't say it. I'll just say that state up north. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That stayed up north, that's where he was from, and, and when he got saved, he really got on fire for God, okay, as a teenager. And he had a friend, one of the guys he played football with, if I remember the story, that had a Doberman, okay, a Doberman pincer. And that Doberman's name was Satan, okay? And that Doberman was a little... It's a little hard to deal with. Let's just put it that way, right? If you rode your bicycle past their house, guess what? Here came Satan, right? If you're walking past the house, here came Satan, right? You drive up in the driveway and pull out of the driveway, and here comes Satan chasing you down the road. A friend of mine, he, when he got saved, sometime later, he bought a Rottweiler, okay? And he named her Sabbath, Okay? Because he wasn't going in the Satan direction and that kind of thing. And, and, and he said, oh, oh, Sabbath, you know, she was out there one day in the, in the yard. 
And he said, I happened to look out the window and, and she's standing in the middle of the yard with her head down and you could tell something was going on. She wasn't convulsing, but you could tell she was kind of going. Ugh. And he said, and then it got gross. You know what she did? She licked up what she just got rid of. And we look at it and we go, why in the world will you do that? You dumb dog, you're mmm. Okay, well notice what he says. As a, re as a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Why is that? Why is that that foolish people continue to go back to that? It's because it's in their character. It's in their nature now. It's been unchecked, whether it was an undisciplined home, whether it was just their, their undisciplined attitude, their desire to please themselves and not please God. Guess what? They are constantly going back to that which causes us to look at and we're going, I can't, I can't even believe you just did that. Why is it? Because it's part of their character. One more verse here on this point. Turn a page over to Proverbs 27. Now it gets worse. Okay? It gets worse for the fool. And you're going, how bad can it be that mind, you know, that, that picture that I got in my mind now of the dog and all that and we were just talking about, how can it be worse than that? Because that's pretty bad. Notice. Verse 22, Proverbs 27, 22 says, though thou shouldest bray. Okay, now we don't use that word in 21st century English necessarily. When we hear the word bray, what do we think of? Maybe a donkey or a mule, right? That's not what this is. You should... thou. Though thou shouldest bray a fool in a mortar among wheat with a pestle. How many have ever used a mortar and pestle? You know what I'm talking about? What are we talking about? What does it mean to bray a fool in a mortar and pestle with wheat? It means to crush. Okay? That's worse than a hundred stripes, although that's bad. We're talking about crushing, okay, a fool among wheat in a mortar and pestle Yet will not his foolishness depart from him. Why is that? Is because his foolishness has become so literally ingrained in him that it is what he is. Period. And that's pretty bad, isn't it? I mean, you thought the dog and vomit and all that kind of stuff was bad, right? This is even worse. This is so ingrained that it doesn't matter what happens to the fool. He will continue to be a fool. And it's a progress. It's a progression. He starts out as a child. We're all there. For whatever reason, he wasn't disciplined the way he should have been. He wasn't learned to be disciplined. He wasn't learned to. It wasn't taught to please the Lord. It wasn't taught to uh, to to uh, check his character and and his emotions and 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 sacrifice and different things like that and become wise. And ultimately, it ends up so that no matter what happens to the fool, he stays a fool. Well, what are some of the characteristics of a fool? Turn to Proverbs chapter 12. I know I'm having you turn quite a bit, but I hope you'll stay up with me. Verse number 15, Proverbs 12, 15. First part of the verse says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. What does that mean? Well, what's wrong with that? Well, why can't I? I think it's a great idea. I'm going to do it anyway. How many of us have ever done that? 
And mom and dad, somebody that's been there, done that, somebody that wants to, to, to teach them how to be wise, to teach them how to please the Lord and that kind of thing might say, hey, look, I've been there, done that, got a t-shirt, doesn't fit anymore, but I still got it, and you don't want to go there. They'll look at you and they'll go, yeah, that's on you, man. I think it's going to be different for me this time. Verse 15, it finishes out and says, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is what? Wise. Wise. Hey, what do you think about this? Okay, I see where you're going with it. And yeah, that might be cool, but have you thought about this? Have you thought about the consequences? Have you thought about later? Have you thought about, is that really a good idea? Should you be doing that? Should a Christian even consider it? A wise man will consider and hearken unto counsel. But the fool is self-reliant. He's fully satisfied with his own way of life. Now, he might grouse and complain and grumble and fuss and carry on about the fact that his life is a little harder than maybe he thought it was going to be? Why would a fool's life be harder than he thought it was going to be? It's because he's a fool, right? It's not because the government had something against him. It's not because his parents, you know, raised him a certain way. It's not because his employers got something out for him and the world just hates him, right? Nobody likes him. So he's going to go out, sit, suck his thumb, eat worms and all that kind of thing. It's not because of that, but fools have a tendency to do that, don't they? They become victims. It's, it's nobody, it's not their fault, it's somebody else's fault, right? He doesn't see any reason to consult with anybody. Why would I do that? I might get wise counsel. I might get a scolding. I might get some stripes. I might get some wise counsel that would really help me. Nah, not going to do it. Look right across the page there. Proverbs 14, 3 says, In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. That rod of pride is literally, could literally be translated a root of pride. Okay? It starts small, just we were talking about sowing, okay? You remember when the, so the seeds got planted in your garden and that kind of thing? It took a while, but what eventually started poking its way through, the, through the, the soil, through the ground? Those little bitty sprigs, right? And that's when you got to keep the, 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 the birds and the raccoons and the deer out of them because, you know, when they're tender and all that, they'll eat them off and so forth. But the root of pride illustrates the haughty spirit growing within a fool, growing within a foolish person, and it's evidenced by his words. Okay? In the mouth of the foolish is a root of pride, a rod of pride. One of the reasons he is, he is foolish is because he has elevated himself, right? He's become proud. How many have ever made a decision? Okay, wait a minute. You know somebody that made a decision that was contrary to what they knew God wanted and the wise counsel that they got. How many have ever seen anybody do that? Well, you know somebody that has done that. We've all seen it, right? But you discuss it with them. You discuss the consequences. They come to you maybe and they go, man, I just can't figure it out. I don't know what's going on. My, this, 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 and this, all these things. Seems like the world is against me. Everybody hates me and so on and so forth. And you go, wait a minute, hang on. What did you do? Oh, that's got nothing to do with that. <laughs> Fact that I made a foolish, and they're not going to tell you I made a foolish decision. They're not going to tell you that. But you can see it because you're wise. And you want to give them good counsel and you say, hey, what about that? Doesn't matter. They're going to go on their way and they're going to remain what? 
foolish. Proverbs 17. Again, I, I know I'm having you turn, but please stay up with me. Proverbs 17. Verse 16. Says, wherefore, now this is an interesting proverb, interesting question. Says, wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? The fool is not going to... Now mark this down. This is very tragic. The fool is not going to gain wisdom. He might go after it. He might come to a wise counselor. He might come to his mom, his dad, his pastor, his teacher, his, his boss, his, a friend, somebody that is, is, is a Christian and, and quote-unquote successful in their life and that kind of thing. And he might go after that. He might sit across the the table or, or lay on the couch with a counselor to gain wisdom, but he's never going to gain it. Why? Because he has no heart for it. He really doesn't want to learn what wisdom is. He doesn't really want to get rid of and give up his foolish, self-centered, self-sufficient way of life. I've had, I can't tell you how many different people in my ministry have come to me, couples that have problems. They call me up and they say, Pastor, we need to meet with you. We need some counseling because we're having whatever kind of communication problem or whatever it is and so on and so forth. And I say, okay, set up a time. I go to their house. They come to my office or, or our house or something like that. We sit there across the table from one another for several hours and, and that kind of thing. And, and I've, I've had couples come to me. as a last resort because there's serious problems and they're contemplating divorce and I show them because I honestly believe this with every fiber of my being here is the answer to your problem this can be fixed and we go through and sometime later, I find out maybe in the paper or somebody tells me from church because we hadn't seen them in a while. Oh, yeah, they got divorced. Well, answer this question for me. Why did they come see me? If they were already planning it. A lot of times, you know what they did? We'll give God a chance. But that's all we're going to do. We're going to go so we can say we went to Pastor Arbuckle, we went to the church, we went to the preacher, but we've already made the decision to make it look like God can't. The counsel we got wasn't good enough. They'll do that. What do they do that for? To ease their conscience. But what is the consequence there? He has no heart for it. He's not going to get it because ultimately, deep down in his character, he doesn't want it. He rejects godly instruction. Go to Proverbs 1. We're going to get to, told you we were going to get there, didn't I? Verse number 7. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What does it mean to despise something? It means to throw it away. It's throw it behind your back. You, mom, dad, you know, whoever it is, given, trying to give wise counsel to the kid and that kind of thing, or to a friend or co-worker or whoever it happens to be, and, and it, they're trying to give it in such a way that it makes an impact in the heart and life of somebody that is not as wise as they could be, should be, and that kind of thing. They look at it and they listen. They sit there very politely and they smile and nod. Thank you. And it goes right behind their back. It goes right in the trash. Don't even, don't, don't, and, and really, honestly, folks, don't waste your breath because he has no heart for it. He's going to reject it anyway. Verse 22. Here's what I was talking about earlier, asking the question. Verse 22, Proverbs 1 
says, How long, ye simple? Will you love simplicity? You scorners delight in their scornings. And notice, fools hate knowledge. The word hate is very strong, and it means the desire to have no contact or relationship with. All right? I was trying to think of an illustration. Me personally, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it this way. I hate eggs. I do not want, nor do I desire, to have contact or relationship with them. I will not eat them, Sam I am. Not on a train, in the rain, in a box with a fox or nothing. I do not want them. Unless you reconstitute them. That's exactly right, brother. Amen. You reconstitute them, and I'll eat them. I was talking to a gentleman on the pistol range yesterday. He's from the Philippines. Do you have any idea what a favorite delicacy of the Philippines is? It's called balut. Balut is almost hatched duck eggs. Okay? And what they'll do, we had a missionary that we supported up when we were up in Monroe County. He was in Manila, the Philippines. I met his little girl, his daughter. She was, I don't know, seven, eight years old, something like that. And I asked her, I said, what's your favorite food? She said, oh, I love balut. And I went, really? She said, oh, yeah. She said, on the way to school every day, she said, I walk by this vendor, and he's got them waiting on me. And they're this big, and they're warm, and they're this, and they're that, and they're... they're Feathers are a little bit hard to deal with, but they're really good. You should try. And I went, eh, eh, no way, no how. <laughs> this fellow member of the pistol club that I'm part of was at the range yesterday. And every time I see him, I asked him if he got his, had his balut. You got your balut? And he goes, nah, you know, don't talk to me. You know, he said, you, I know you don't like balut. You don't like eggs. And he asked me, he said, what is it about them you don't like? My sister asked me the same question when I was a teenager. Donald, what is it about eggs you don't like? I don't like the taste, the looks, the smell, nor the texture. And she said, that pretty much covers it, doesn't it? Absolutely. I don't like it. Okay? But notice what it says here in verse 22 of Proverbs 1. The fool hates knowledge. The fool hates wisdom. What does it mean? He has no desire to have contact or relationship with it. Now, how terrible is that? Isn't that a horrible way of living? But see, the fool doesn't care. The fool doesn't care. It's in his character. It doesn't matter what kind of consequences he deals with. And you know, wise people can see it coming. And they probably have told him, if you keep on going the way you're going, your life is going to be miserable and it may end prematurely. And they go, eh, but maybe not. And they go on their way. Chapter 14. Last time I'm going to have you turn. He's void of wisdom because he rejects God's instructions. Look at verse number 8, Proverbs 14. It says, The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. But the folly of fools is deceit. What does that mean? Well, Solomon is contrasting the prosperity and good reputation which come to the wise. How many of you want to have a good reputation? When people hear your name, they say, yeah, I know them. Man, those guys, uh, that gal, that guy, man, I'm telling you what, that family, that church, whatever it is, those people, th those people are great. They got a good reputation. I'll tell you what, they're super people. What do you have to do? Is there a prerequisite for that? Yeah. Just be wise. Do what's pleasing to the Lord. Follow his instruction. But Solomon is contrasting the prosperity and good reputation which come to the wise 
with that which comes to the fool because of his foolishness. What does the fool have for his foolishness? We already heard about it. He gets more folly, but ultimately, notice what it says there in verse 8. The folly of fools is deceit. He is so deceived by his foolishness, his foolishness talks him into believing, deceives him into believing that if he continues on in his foolish way, things are going to go well with him. But what happens? Just the opposite, right? He has nothing but his foolishness at the end of the day. He's deceived by his own folly. Yeah, it's going to be great. You can do your own thing. Make your own decisions. Be your own man. Go right ahead. And you know, sometimes I think it's sad, but I understand a little bit. Because God doesn't want robots, does he? He doesn't want robots that he can wind up and set on their path, does he? What does he want? He wants obedient, loving children who will do as he says, do as he suggests, do as his word says, because we love him. That's what he wants. But he's more than willing to let us go our own way. But then we have to deal with the consequences. So what's the answer? Proverbs 1.7, I won't have you turn... Turn there, we already looked at it. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What does it mean? How do we become wise? If you look at your life right now this morning, and, 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 and I'm not talking about a periodic, because we all do that. We all do foolish things. I'm not talking about that person. I'm talking about that person whose life is characterized by making decisions based on what they want, not necessarily what God wants, not necessarily what's best for them. They're going to do it because they want to do it, and they go ahead and do that. How do you change it? The fear of the Lord. That's what it is. The fool... In the book of Psalms, there's a couple different places where it says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, in our translation, our English translation, those two words there is are in italics, which could verify and mean that they're not there in the original Hebrew. Be that as it may, it doesn't change the fact that the fool has said in his heart, no, no. Either that God does not exist or no, God, I'm not going to do what you say. It doesn't matter. The fool has still said in his heart, no, I'm not going to do it. He will bear the consequences of his own actions. He will have nobody to blame, although he will. And he will he will die. Miserable unproductive, a terrible testimony, and a horrible statement if he happens to be a Christian. Because there can be foolish Christians, can't there? I think there was a whole book of the Bible, First, uh, what was that, First, Corinth, First Corinthians maybe? A whole bunch of foolish baby Christians. All the problems. So what's the answer? It's to find out what the Lord has to say And then do what he says. No questions asked. Trusting him. Determined to make proper decisions. Decisions that will please the Lord. Decisions that he will be more than happy to bless. Decisions that when you look back on it in the future, the consequences are blessing and not cursing. My question to you this morning is this. Which do you want to be? I'm not saying that anybody here is. But like I said before, in the beginning, we're all prone to it. 
So we have to guard against it. Don't wait till you get in there and you're dealing with the consequences of foolish actions to say, oh, wait a minute, hang on just a second. Be wise regarding knowledge, regarding wisdom. Fear the Lord. It's the beginning of that. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray your blessings on our invitation time. And Lord, we, we pray that you would help us because we are so prone as the as the songwriter said, we're prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Help us, Lord, to determine to be on guard against those temptations, even our old fleshly nature, that black dog that lives inside us. Satan, the flesh and the world don't want us to do that which is pleasing in your sight, but we must, we must do that. Help us because we love you. Help us because we want to honor you. Help us because we want to make the proper testimony and the proper impact in the hearts and lives of others. Help us, Lord, because we don't want to have to deal with the consequences of the fool 